afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation, a think tank, but I'm here on behalf of the wider sector um, of around 20 organizations, mainly think tanks, but some similar ones, things called funders, trade unions, or membership organizations, but they're all, they all share similarities, which is they're aiming to understand the world and hopefully to improve the world. And they cover a wide range of subjects from economics to health, which before the pandemic we thought were very separate subjects and the last year has taught us aren't quite as separate as we all um, thought they were. But as I say, working on different areas, but something that they all share is that the world of policy making needs to do better in lots of ways, but one way in which it needs to do better is in terms of representation, whether that's about the ethnicity, the people that work in it, whether it's about the volume of people uh, with disabilities who work in it, whether it's about class backgrounds, and actually whether it's about age, the, um, and a number of other uh, areas. So across a range of areas, we need to do better on representation. Now that matters in all organisations, and one of the good things over previous years has been a growing recognition of that in all sectors, corporate, third sector, and the public sector. But it's particularly important uh, in organisations that are involved in public policy, that are involved in setting public debates and about providing potential answers to those uh, debates. Because if you're not representative, then you won't be thinking broadly about those, those issues and you won't be coming at them from a range of uh, perspectives. So, the, um, uh, so that's why this webinar is happening today, because there's a recognition, a shared recognition of a problem. But that's only of use to anybody if something actually changes in the coming years. Now, organisations themselves obviously need to work on how they recruit, and I think the sector is generally changing on that front, but we also want people to know about the sector, to want to apply, to think that that is a place where they could find their, their home. It shouldn't matter whether your mum or dad can explain to you what a think tank is, and if anyone finds a mum or dad that can explain what a think tank is, they're doing better than I suspect uh, most of them. But that shouldn't matter to whether people um, are applying to work in these organisations, and it certainly shouldn't matter to whether or not people find a home and a job in those organisations. So what we're going to cover in this webinar today is what think tanks are, what they do, what it's like to work for one, or at least what some people have found it's like to work for one. And also, I think it's importantly, what other organisations that are closely similar in some ways, or that they work with day to day, so we can give you a sense of the broader sector, not just the bits of it that we all uh, collectively um, work in. Now, all of us, when we've you know, been planning out this uh, webinar, and I should say thank you to the team, quite a large team of people that have been working today to make today uh, happen. Then we're also painfully aware that this is a tough time for people to be looking for you know, work. This is not the world we all wanted to find ourselves in in lots of different ways. There's lots of grim news, including on the unemployment front in the news um, day to day. And we know, you know, for young people in particular, this is a hard crisis and it comes on back of a tough time, you know, all the ideals of people thinking that they were going to be owning a home by the time they were 25 feel like a very long time ago, as in before most of our lifetimes. So the goal of today is to make that feel a little bit easier. And I do I want to end on a, a positive before handing over and getting going on this seminar, which is that, you know, a generation ago when I was starting work in these kinds of worlds, the um, the 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 if anything, reflecting back on it, the problem was that far too many people thought they had all the answers, okay? Now that was a substantive problem because it turned out they were wrong and didn't have all the answers. The, um, but it was also a problem in terms of um, what people thought they were doing by taking up these careers. And one thing that is very, very clear in a country that has been just the last decade through a huge financial crisis, a big internal row about Brexit and now the pandemic is a really strong recognition that we don't have all the answers we need, whether that's how to make an economy grow, how to make sure we fairly spread the rewards of that economy, how to reduce health inequality, or how to deliver net zero in the decades ahead. There are big questions to answer. And for people starting out on their careers, I hope that means that there's, there's an exciting things for you to do in the coming years. It's not about going to work in a think tank and there being nothing interesting to work on. There are a lot of very big questions um, uh, to work on, and that is a good time to think about a career. Now, the only other thing I want to say is don't, when you're thinking about that, set yourself ludicrous tests that you fail to meet. People, only very, very odd people really know what they're going to be doing with their lives over the course of more than like the next few years. So don't think in those terms. Instead, I would think in terms of what are the interesting questions that I want to help contribute to in a society to help answer? And where are the opportunities that happen to be available now 
to do that in the future. I think if you think in those terms, then I hope the people you're going to hear from later today uh, and hopefully in the months ahead will be able to help you think through those things. And as I say, there are a lot of big questions worth thinking about. So maybe just pick one rather than agonizing about uh, everything in life. And just to finish off, I hope to see lots of you in the years and maybe even the decades to come. And whatever you decide about your careers and your future, we hope that the next few hours are really useful to you. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for everyone that's organized uh, this seminar. I think it's a really important thing for the sector as a whole, and hopefully it's useful to all of you. And now I'm going to hand over to Nicola Blacklaws from the Institute for Government, who is chairing uh, the sessions that are following. She's going to run you through what's going to happen for the rest of the day. But I hope this is useful to you and have a good day, everyone. Over to you, Nicola. Fab. Thanks, Torsten. Thanks for that kind of overview of, of the event and what we're trying to what we're trying to do here. Um, I'd also like to echo his thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend the event. It's fantastic to see um, that we've got so many of you with us. Um, as Torsten said, my name's Nicola. I work at a think tank called the Institute for Government, and I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes telling you a bit about how the event's going to work before we move on to our two excellent speakers for the rest of uh, this first session. So there are lots of organisations involved in this uh, event, I think 20-ish in total, and they all have different ways of working and, as Torsten mentioned, um, focus on different policy areas. Um, and the focus of today's event is really on insight into and kind of career paths within the sector. Um, so it might not be possible to answer specific questions about individual organisations, but we'll be sending around some FAQs afterwards, including information on how to get in touch with specific organisations if you need to. Um, and I also wanted to quickly mention that in the email you received about this event with all the Zoom links into the sessions, there's a link to an equal opportunities form that if you have a second after the event, we'd be really grateful if you filled out. It just helps us to analyse the reach of the event and helps us to plan our kind of outreach going forward. So for the rest of this se first session, we have two speakers. We have Nicole Sykes, who's the Director of External Affairs at Pro Bono Economics, and Sarah Arnold, Senior Economist at the New Economics Foundation. Nicole is going to give an overview kind of introduction to think tanks and the wider sector. Um, and then we're going to take some questions from you guys um, in the audience. And then Sarah is going to give some kind of general guidance on making good applications for jobs in think tanks in the sector. And then she'll take some questions after that as well well. Um, in terms of how the Q&A will work, you can use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Um, you might find it easier to do that as we're going along as things occur to you. Um, and then I'll look through them and put them to our speakers. Or when it gets to that part of the session, you can use the raise hand function also at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will kind of call you out. Our excellent technical support team will unmute you um, and you can ask your question that way if you prefer to do that. Um, after that, after this session, we're going to split off into groups and you all have the option to go to three out of six more focus sessions, depending on your interests. And these are kind of designed to replace the networking that we would, would have been possible uh, at a live event. And the aim is to give you an opportunity to ask um, questions directly to a range of people from all the organisations taking part. So without further ado, I will hand over to Nicole. Take it away. Thank you. I'm going to desperately try to share my screen, which this at this point in the pandemic, I should be able to do it. Um, and hopefully you can see slides up there. Fabulous. All right. So my job today is to let you know what is a think tank. Um, it can sound pretty mysterious. I know some people think of think tanks. They think of a bunch of faceless people sat in a basement somewhere having deep thoughts and whispering into the ears of government. Uh, and as Torsten mentioned, even people who are quite close to people who are, are within this world also don't know um, what we do. I asked my mother a couple of years ago what she thought my job was. And she told me it was, well, you, you write to the prime minister and, and tell her what to do, don't you? Um, and I couldn't tell if that was making my job sound really boring or really grand. Um, but either way, I'm going to try and explain this afternoon what a think tank is and what you can do on one. So hopefully there'll be less mysterious. Um, so what do think tanks do at their core? And you should have seen in the event invitation today, and as Torsten was saying, it's about solving problems. Um, step one for most think tanks is identifying those problems and whether that's diving into the data and the numbers that exist out there to try and figure out what's going on, 
or if it's talking to people, holding focus groups, holding interviews, trying to understand what's going on in the country or the world. Um, it's about identifying problems. And then hopefully trying to suggest some solutions to those problems, um, often working with others and trying to figure out, okay, who should be doing what to fix what's going on in this world. Um, and then finally, to various degrees, think tanks will try and persuade others to adopt their solutions. That might just be working with policymakers and saying, hey, we've learned this stuff, we think it's useful to you. Or it might be going out there and really actively trying to campaign and influence people to adopt their solutions. And, and different think tanks will take different approaches. What kind of think tanks, uh, what kind of problems do think tanks try and solve? Well, these are just some of the headlines that the think tanks that you um, will be meeting today uh, have generated over the last couple of weeks. Um, it really is a huge variety out there. Um, there is a think tank for everyone, depending on what your niche is, even if it's, uh, you know, um, how do bioluminescent algae generate uh, 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 green energy? There's a think tank out there. Um, uh, so, so really, but this, this is what people see from the outside. They see the headlines, they see the focus on policy and problems. What does it actually look inside? Um, well, to, to, to take you through that, I'm going to start with the people who make up a think tank. If you want to understand sort of the car engine, let's understand its parts. Now, no two think tanks are the same, but they will have one of three, they will have three core components as a rule. Um, starting with the policy and research team, probably who you think about when you think of a, um, uh, when you think of a think tank, the people doing the thinking. They may be economists like Sarah, they may be academics, they may be um, just generalists, just people generally interested in solving problems. Um, and certainly in my experience, the better think tanks and the better research teams have a huge variety of expertise. In my last team working on Brexit and migration policy, um, we had a climate researcher and she brought tons of different um, points of view that we never would have had before and made us stronger. I work on charity policy now and we have a housing expert, we have a guy who did a degree in musicology. Um, and really it's just people who want to solve problems working together. Um, but it's all very well, as I said, having ideas if you then don't do anything with them. Um, and so most think tanks will have some form of external affairs team, it might not be called that, but they'll have some sort of team focused on getting the policy and research out into the world. Um, that might be through events like this one and the wonderful events team we have here uh, about having discussions and getting your ideas out there and also getting other ideas into the mix. Um, similarly, there are often communications functions, people working with the media, people on social media, um, doing design and marketing who make the policy and research look good. So people want to read it and want to engage in it um, and display it in different ways. And also some think tanks will have public affairs teams people who are focused on relationships with policymakers and government, convincing them that they want to work with the think tanks and take up their ideas. And last but very much not least, there are also the operations teams within think tanks, people working on finance and systems and basically keeping roofs over our heads and uh, making sure that the lights stay on and everyone gets paid. Um, they are absolutely essential. So whatever your interest, there is some role within a think tank for you. There are many, many different um, roles you can play. But maybe nothing on there particularly jumps out at you. Maybe, maybe you haven't yet found your think tank niche. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the think tank ecosystem that Torsten mentioned, because it's not just those think tanks that have these three parts. There are other organizations that have these parts, plus some other bits that have some crossover. So if that's your think tank um, uh, there with your policy, your operations and your external affairs, there are also membership organizations and unions. Um, who are the members of these? Well, they can really vary. There are business groups, for example, who have businesses as their members, people like the CBI or the British Chambers of Commerce. There are professional organizations where the engineers will join the Institute of Engineering um, or the unions where the workers are their members. And for all of these organizations, they will have something like a think tank at their heart. They will have a policy unit by and large, they will have a policy unit, they will be coming up with ideas and trying to convince governments or other people to adopt their ideas or just to make their sector better. 
um, uh, and they will also um, have other roles um, within them. They may have people doing their sales of their memberships, managing their members to make sure they get what they need or delivering them services, but there's lots of crossover in between. One of the other um, sectors that has a lot of crossover is charities. Now that might surprise you, but if I say something like Cancer Research UK, they have a whole policy team, a whole public affairs team that looks pretty much exactly like any think tank would embedded within them, trying to talk to government and saying, look, this is what you need to do. Also trying to talk to hospitals and other health providers saying, look, this is how policy can change so we can do better for people with cancer. Um, if you're in that world, you will also, of course, you know, charities don't just do that. They're also looking at the services they deliver. There are fundraising roles in there as well. Um, so lots of routes through to sort of a think tank adjacent world. Of course, there's also the private sector. And I've just picked out three elements where there's lots of crossover with think tanks. One of the agencies, public affairs agencies, people who specialize in um, that public affairs element, selling things into government, convincing people. Um, uh, if, you, if you work in one of those, there's often then routes into think tanks as well, specifically on the government side. And you get a really great real world experience of a small number of businesses that you work for and, and what they care about. Similarly, lots of businesses will have a small public affairs and policy team, certainly big businesses. Um, if you think about the pandemic and someone like Pfizer, for example, they will have had their public affairs team working really closely with government to say, look, these are the things that need to change to make sure that we can get our vaccine out to everyone. Um, and will have made probably more of an impact than, than some of the think tanks have. Um, and then finally, the media, you know, if you are interested in the communication side about the headlines and that kind of thing, um, then there are lots of uh, sort of routes from media into think tanks too. Final two, so I'm just wrapping up with obviously government. Um, most think tanks, when they are looking to change policy and, and change how the country works, they're generally focused at government. That's not always true. There may be other groups, but government's a really big stakeholder. And if you go into work for the civil service or you go in to be a researcher for an MP or for a, an assistant to a council group, um, or just, just, just go ahead, get elected, I guess. Um, but if you do that, then you'd have a really great ex uh, experience of how policies are actually made. You get that real life experience, which is hugely valuable if you want to join a think tank. And finally, academia. Of course, there's tons of routes between think tanks and academia. Some think tanks are very, very academic, some are less so. Um, and I think you'll see some of that kind of pulled out and explored at the events later today. So hopefully that will have given you an overview of what think tanks do, what are the different jobs that you can have within them, and what are the different jobs that link to them. Hopefully that is less mysterious. I've not yet tested this on my mum, but if your feedback's good, I'll give it a go. Fab. Thanks so much, Nicole. OK, so we've got a couple of minutes to pause for questions at this point. I'm just looking at the Q&A now and we've already had a few coming in. So the first one I'm going to ask is from um, Chris Wright, and he asks whether all research team, research team people do external affairs work as well, or are they generally different people working on these kind of distinct tasks? That is a great question. Um, by and large, most people will do both. Um, not least because, um, uh, not always, uh, I saw Sarah raise an eyebrow, <laughs> um, uh, not always, but certainly in my experience, most people will do both. Mostly because it helps if you are a researcher to be engaging with the people you're trying to influence from the start. It's not just, here's a report, I'm gonna chuck it at you. Um, it's how do we work together? What are the problems that you're seeing? Um, and what are some of the solutions that you'd like testing out? So by and large, um, if you're doing this really well, you are working together. Um, some teams might just have sort of experts in the public affairs side um, who can help people who don't have that experience to um, go out and make the most of their research on the public affairs side. Great. Um, we have another question here. Matt asks, how are think tanks funded? Oh, great question. Um, lots of different ways. Um, I will give you three examples. Um, uh, one is uh, sort of through endowment. So a large grant or philanthropic individual will say, 
you know, I'm going to give you this investment or this pot of money. I, I'm, so, I'm explaining this in the simplest possible terms. Um, uh, and I want you to do research around this topic area. And it's sort of your job to work out what you do with that budget. Some think tanks, um, and this is where the academic side comes in, some think tanks will apply for grants for their particular kind of research. They'll partner with a university or academic institution, um, or they'll be applying for grants from other philanthropic sources. So rather than having one funder, they'll be going out to lots of different ones. Um, and some are consultancy based. So they will sell their research. They will say you can, you know, whoever you are, you can if, if we have an expertise on this, you can buy our research and our reports. Um, and that might be selling it to the Welsh government, um, or it might be selling it to um, a charity, or it might be selling it to a business. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so those are probably the three main ways, endowments, grants, and um, consultancy fees. And some will do a mix, it should be said as well. Sure, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have one last question for Nicole, and then we're gonna move on to Sarah. So, um, Emily Cushlow asks, um, how best would you work out which part of the think tank best fits your skills? It's a, it's a really good question. Yeah. And I don't think there's one, um, uh, I don't think there's one route. Um, I think what I'm hoping to communicate with the ecosystem side of things is that there's lots of movement between them. And you can start out looking for, you know, if, if you're starting on that journey, it's what sounds interesting? What do I what do I want to work on? What's out there? And you can try it for a bit and then you learn a load of skills. And if you decide that actually your bit of, of policy and research isn't what you want to do, find somewhere else. You've learned loads, you've you've learned loads of skills. They're really, really transferable. And you you should be able to shift between any parts of those ecosystems. Um, and generally be stronger for it. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't stress too much about the first job being the perfect job because it, it really will be, but you will learn a lot and you, you you need to focus on getting what you can out of it. Wow. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, so now I'm gonna hand over to Sarah from the New Economics Foundation, who's gonna get into the thorny issue of applying for jobs in this sector. Go for it, Sarah. Hi. Um, I, yeah, as I have not got a set of slides or a presentation, I'm afraid, but I am going to talk you through um, the process, the application process that we have at NEF, and that is quite similar to many other organisations, having um, asked around a little bit, and then share a couple of tips that I've, um, that I've got from a bunch of different colleagues. So just for some background, I have been involved in hiring three assistant researchers um, at the New Economics Foundation over the last two years. Um, uh, two, I was on the interview panel and one just sifting. Um, and assistant researchers are what we call the, I guess, the entry level um, part, <laughs> researcher part on the policy side in particular. Um, so the way it works for us is um, you, it's like a lot of application processes, you submit an application and we have a specific form. Others may ask for a cover letter and CV. Um, we then shortlist applications. Um, now, normally we get somewhere between 100 and 500 applications for each of our um, entry level positions. Um, and the most recent one had was at the upper end of that, I think. So that's it's, I'm not trying to put anyone off, but it's important to be not disheartened, I guess, if you don't necessarily get the first job that you apply for, because to some extent it is just, um, it is, there's a quite a significant element of luck as well. Although you can obviously do a lot to, to kind of come around that. So we get all these applications and then we shortlist them um, by explicitly scoring all applications in terms of whether a person has met the specification criteria as specified on the job description. Most job descriptions will have a list of required elements and a list of desirable elements. Um, our, we um, score specifically on the required elements. So you will potentially be shortlisted if you have all the required elements. You do not need to have all the desirable elements. It's the required elements that we really focus on. Um, and that's another point that I really wanna impress upon everybody because um, I think a lot of times people are put off by these long lists of desirable skills and desirable additional things that um, get put on job descriptions. To be honest, a lot of the time that is just done by by people kind of just thinking about what would be desirable, but they're genuinely not required. So some people would only apply for a job if they have literally everything on that list. I actually am one of those people, um, but 
that doesn't, or I felt like I was one of those people, but that you shouldn't necessarily need, need them. Um, and so I would strongly encourage everyone to apply as long as you have all the required elements. The desirable ones are kind of nice, additional, nice to have, but are not completely necessary. So we'll score everybody. Um, you must, we'll basically score each element against, um, against criteria where you get a naught if something's not met, one if it's partially met, or two if it's fully met, and you need to get a two in all required things to be eligible. Um, and then we look at all the top scorers and essentially pick our, our favourites um, in a discussion um, internally. We then invite the shortlisted candidates to interview. So normally we invite six people to interview from our pool of between 100 and 500. So it really is narrowing down quite a lot. You'll then have a short task to write a blog and an interview um, and sometimes a second interview. But so given all that, here are some specific tips that I've, uh, I've gathered from talking to a variety of different colleagues. So firstly, you will probably be one of um, lots of applicants. So really make it easy to see how you meet the job spec and address absolutely everything that is required in the desirable thing. Um, you could quite, it can be quite easy to just simply kind of bullet point and explicitly use the wording from a job description um, or an application um, so that you stand out to the people who are just sifting through the applications. Um, you basically want to make it as easy as possible for the person reading your application to understand exactly how you meet the criteria specified. Um, now, that might seem a little bit like you're kind of just, I was a bit worried that my first application didn't look very sophisticated because it was just a list of bullet points about how I'd address, how I met the kind of the job specification. But that, now that I've been the one on the other side kind of reading through all the applications, that is perfect. That is exactly what you want. You just want to see how someone meets the criteria that you've asked for. Um, the second thing is don't worry too much about demonstrating things through formal work experience or not through formal work experience or however, whatever your experiences are, just think about how those experiences explicitly uh, link to whatever is required in the job specification. Um, you can use a university project for something. For example, if it says working in a team, feel free to use a university project if that is your experience that you've got. Um, I, for example, there was um, a bit in my um, one that asked for application, uh, sorry, that asked for experience using um, a specific statistical analysis software that I had only used at university. I hadn't used in any kind of professional capacity. Um, I was worried that that meant that I wasn't eligible, um, but I applied anyway. And it turned out that was completely fine. I've been taught on the job. It's not been an issue. So it's fine to just be honest about your experiences and it's fine to use university experiences if that's what you've got. Um, thirdly, it's really helpful to demonstrate clearly your interest in the values of the organisation. Um, not potentially just by repeating phrases of the website, but it's, it's helpful to specifically engage with one or two pieces of recent research that you found particularly insightful or particularly interesting and explain why in the application, just so people can see why you're specifically interested in, in this organization as opposed to another organization. Um, it's also fine if you don't have kind of the kind of the standard, um, a standard route, that's completely fine. If you've got previous work experience in, in a completely different sector, um, just be clear about that and talk about how the skills that you've got from there might apply. So. Um, our most recent assistant researcher, um, he spent three years working at Vodafone before switching into the think tank sector and was able to demonstrate um, in his interview how his experience of working in a team at Vodafone meant that he had skills to work in a team at the, organize, at the organization I work for. Um, another point is to ask for feedback. So you may not get a job or you may not even get an interview because there will potentially be quite a few candidates applying. It's completely fine to ask for feedback. Sometimes you're really, really close. Um, it might just be that somebody else was, um, had a very a more specific fit, or it might be that you had a really good application, but there was, say, one thing missing. So it's completely fine to ask for feedback and can be really helpful if you do apply and just miss out. Um, and finally, you do not necessarily need any kind of specific degree, but it really will vary by think tank. So um, at the New Economics Foundation, we do not require um, any specific degree um, of any kind for any of our positions. I don't, oh, the chief economist is required to have a first degree of some kind, 
but actually our chief economist doesn't even have an economics degree. He has a geography degree um, and a lot of interest and um, on the job training in economics. So you don't necessarily need to have kind of what you might think of as standard, but that is that does vary across different think tanks. So what I would do when thinking about kind of your education pathway, if you do have a couple of think tanks or, or think tanks you might be interested in working in in mind, have a look at what they require, um, because it is quite variable. Some of them might need um, a master's in a specific subject. But even if you don't necessarily have the exact requirement as set out in the job description, it's worth, if it's somewhere you really want to work, just giving them a ring and seeing or, or contacting someone on LinkedIn, setting out your experiences and asking them if they think that it is a relevant fit, because you might find that it actually is. Um, often what's put out on job descriptions is very much a one size fits all thing, but obviously everyone's got a lot of very different experiences. So it's about learning how to translate your experiences into the job description or specification that is there to um, get people's attention. Fab. Thanks very much, Sarah. You covered so much useful ground there. Um, so I'm glad that you covered um, requirements or norm requirements about degrees because loads of people have asked about that. Um, we've also had a really good question from Ella who asks about whether work in the think tank sector is stable and whether you tend to be employed for a period of time to research something specific or if you stick with the same employer kind of regardless of project if you like. So that that is as far as I understand it very variable by think tank depending on their funding model. Um, a lot of think tanks do at least try uh, for junior roles to provide some kind of continuity and certainty. Um, so it may be that you would apply to work at a think tank, you might start on a specific project but you then might work on another project later, depending on, on the funding. But that isn't true of all think tanks. Some do have kind of a, a specific fixed term funding model. I think that's getting rarer though, and um, more and more think tanks are, are very keen to provide um, kind of that continuity and that support because it's also um, quite stressful <laughs> for, for junior staff to constantly feel like they have to switch. Um, and so that is the direction that many think tanks are trying to move. Um, you might find that they say um, on the application that it's an initially a fixed term contract, say for a year, with a possibility of future extensions. That happens more at a senior level because that's more about you fundraising essentially for your own <laughs> future position and happens less at a junior level. Um, but it's also completely fine to ask if you see something like that, like a fixed term contract to say, what, what do you think is the likelihood of it being extended? How, how have people in the past, have they been extended? Have they been kept on? Um, and that can provide a bit more insight for you um, to see whether that is gonna provide you any kind of security. And then it's your choice basically, whether you want a job with security or whether you want that opportunity. Sure. Um, there's been a couple of other questions about from a few different people about whether it's better to work for a more for a larger or more established organization or whether people should aim for smaller organizations. Obviously, that's um, there's probably an element of personal preference there, but I wondered if you've got any thoughts about that, what the benefits are maybe of, of working for organizations of different sizes. Um, so I can only talk about my experiences. I've worked, I would say, probably mostly for relatively small organisations. I started off work, working in a very small organisation with only five people. And now I work in an organisation that's got 50 people. That, Neff. Um, working in a very small organisation is good in many ways in that you get a lot more responsibility very quickly in that if you demonstrate your abilities, it's a small team, everyone does everything. So that can be really good. But you also then have less people to learn from um, and you potentially have less opportunities to focus. Um, so there's kind of, I guess it's a swings and roundabouts thing. I think um, for me, it was really great to have some experiences in a small organisation, but I do, I personally appreciate having more colleagues to learn from um, and I guess more opportunities to do different things as well because it's a bigger organization not in terms of my role but in terms of subject areas because I can move around and they've got more we're, we're less specialized because we're bigger yeah that makes total sense 
Okay, fantastic. So we're pretty much out of time for this session now. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have got six sessions over the next hour and a half, um, where you'll be able to talk to team members from different organisations about their role, and maybe be, who will be also be able to cover some of the questions. We've had loads of questions in no way we could cover all of them in our time. Um, some of those sessions are running concurrently, so you can choose kind of option A or option B to attend, but all the sessions will be available, um, recordings of them on the Resolution Foundation website afterwards. Um, the first two are gonna start at 4.45, so 10 minutes from now. Um, session 2A is on influencing policy and session 2B is focusing on communications and media. Um, sessions 3A and 3B will start at quarter past five and the final pair of sessions will start at 5.40 and the links to join all these sessions are in the email sent to you earlier today. Um, so go and um, have a break and stretch your legs and then come back for the next round of sessions. Um, so I just like to thank Torsten and Nicole and Sarah again for their contributions to this session and hopefully we'll see you in those next sessions shortly. Thanks very much. <laughs>